As Stella from Journey to Babel. Uh, my name is Laurie Dale. No, I mean you're out here. Oh, I am a Denebian slime devil. We have very large houses on Troy, especially in the upper class, which I belong to, and it's uh takes you have to clean them by yourself. There are two classes of people. There's your mono-colored, and then there's your duo-colored. I'm Ambassador X from uh, Ecosystem 4, and I just had to get here for the Star Trek convention, because uh, I've been viewing it on a monitor uh, on my planet. Star Trek lives because there are a lot of people who respect good science fiction. For about three years. You know, you can't help but love them. Well, it was innovative. It was done with... Um, uh, Gene Roddenberry had a tremendous um, penchant for detail. It had authenticity. It had relevance. Uh, um, even when he did a show with monsters, they were properly motivated. And it was, um, uh, in a sense, uh, it was television's version of um, 2001 Clockwork Orange and that whole genre of uh, realistic, uh, uh, not necessarily message-laden, but um, a point of view laden film. In 1966, September, Star Trek came on the air for the first time. Two weeks before the pilot was even shown, I was nudging people, look at it, look at it, because I had read this little thing in TV Guide with a picture. I said, this looks fantastic. It looks like a real science fiction TV series. And the night of the pilot, of course, I went crazy. And the day after, I started pestering my friends. We're starting a club now. We'd like to see Star Trek back on the air because it was the first serious science fiction program on television. Before that time, there were several minor kitty programs, but nothing that dealt with science fiction as it truly is. The speculative fiction, uh, thoughts about the future, thoughts that, that would incorporate a, a true uh, possible harmony for the entire world and for the entire galaxy. They speak about the mission of the Enterprise being to boldly go, a split infinitive I heard every single time, to boldly go where no man has ever gone before. They mean it primarily, I suppose, in territorially. They're visiting stars that no man has till then ever visited. They're going through vast distances no man has ever penetrated. But in addition, they're meeting problems that man has not faced. Star Trek really presented was the brotherhood of intelligence. It mattered not what form the intelligence took or what kind of universe the intelligence built for it. If it was intelligent, if it was intelligent enough to build a culture, then it had the right to live in that culture. It had the right to exist and be. And no other culture had a right to interfere with it as long as it was not endangering cultures beyond itself. We try to measure our behavior according to uh, the Vulcan ideals of tolerance, if you understand what I mean. That's why I wear, this is the idiot. Infinite diversity and infinite combination. The ideal that, that we can coexist with each other, not just passively, but that the interactions of people who live differently can produce something greater than either of the two could produce by themselves. We did anti-war stories when other shows on the air could not mention Vietnam. Uh, we did um, one that was simply anti any war at all, and then one that was specifically anti-Vietnam. We did stories that simply said you have to recognize that people who aren't of your own race or color uh, are your brothers, whether you like it or not. Star Trek was, in a sense, the sanest, the most meaningful, it tackled real social problems. It was not devoted entirely to adventure. And most of all, it had fully realized characters. Uh, naturally, Spock springs to mind. The rational, sane man. And there's something very comforting about sanity, especially in a world like ours. I think it's the extreme logic of the character. It's uh, something along the lines of perhaps a future evolution of uh, mankind. I think everybody would like to be cool, would like to be able to hide their emotions because um, it makes them, I don't know, it makes them superior to be able to hide everything from a person. I thought it was rather intriguing the way they handled it. No matter how successful 
as Star Trek was with its viewers, no matter how intensely it pleased its viewers, unfortunately, the medium of television these days depends entirely upon a mass audience. They sell advertising time. That is their business. The program is merely a way of enticing you to watch the advertising. And if there isn't enough of an audience, the advertisers won't come, regardless of how intensely pleased the audience they do get is. In the case of Star Trek, these problems were encountered very early. Gene Roddenberry fought them constantly. We all supported the concept that it could be something fresh, it could be something special, it could be something different. It could be done right. It could be done meaningfully. It could be done in a way which would be entertaining to those who are looking for entertainment. It could be provocative for those who are willing to accept the provocative concepts that it presented. And in a way that would be uplifting for those who were available to that element. Uh, we are very, very proud of the fact that so many of the episodes captured so many of those important elements and that you were there to help support us, to let us know that you were picking up on the things that were happening in the show. The universe it created was self-consistent, imaginative, and makes its viewers long to be part of it. And they didn't want to see it come to an end. It's just the happiest day of my entire life. I never expected to see him. I, I'm just so beautiful. I can't help it. <laughs> You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. Writer and a fast writer, which he did an outline that it didn't work quite well and he was going to do another one. And we're waiting for the outline. We're waiting. It's been over a year. Sooner or later, he's going to get that outline to us and we'll start working on the movie. But we're really waiting for Chris Claremont. I would rather not give it to another writer yet, because I always feel the X-Men, I used to think it was mine, but I think right now Chris has made that his book, and I think he should have first crack at writing that movie. Sir. Now, we're trying to see if we can develop Doctor Strange as a TV series. And we, we have one network that's starting to get mildly interested. You see, the big problem is Marvel at the moment. That's the reason I mentioned the network is getting interested, and if we can convince the network that there are enough board calls. Hey, don't ever use the word board calls. In, in separate locations and not coordinated to the last minute. Never met each other before. And <laughs> All television land. I'm introducing you. Uh, my name is Bob Kirby. I'm not sure what I do. Pull up copy of comics. I I uh, got this loosely sort of like me. We put together pro comics for the Mid Ohio Con. It's only a dollar on the Ian Shire, if you look real close, there are worms up here. Thank you. 
Yeah, you know, I go up for life, when it comes back, I'll buy the damn thing. <laughs> well, bite your tongue. Why did you bring us here? One of the first things you want to we met at Chicago. Um, no, that's okay, I look different then. No beard. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope you see that, my friend. That's why there are so many characters. As the convention turns. Stay out your way here, man. Be scared. This won't hurt you. Thank you. 
Watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia. Well, on a lighter note, it was like a trip back to the 70s in Troy today. Fans of the rock group Kiss converged on the Northfield Hilton for the first annual Kiss convention. Some even dressed the part. Dealers from all over the world were there selling almost any type of Kiss memorabilia you could imagine. Some fans even got an extra treat, a special appearance by Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley, two of the original band members. Well, two members of the colorful rock group KISS went to court today in Detroit to get the boot, literally. Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley, two original members of KISS. And this poster we're going to show you may jog your memory of the costumes they used to wear in the late 70s and 80s. Well, some of those costumes and some wild boots disappeared from a warehouse a couple years ago. Yesterday, they turned up at a KISS convention in Troy. We were very careful in uh, identifying the people who we believed literally took it or received stolen goods, and we basically just went in and got them. When something is important to you, whether it's a photo album or something that, that is near and dear to you from your past, it's rightfully yours, and to see someone else have it and making money off it is really unfair. In that temporary... Oakland Circus Judge Gene Schnell's ordered the costumes returned to KISS. Nevertheless, the band members promise that they have no intention of dressing like this on their upcoming tour. For Trekkies, there's a line of Star Trek The Next Generation toys, including a Whoopi Goldberg doll and a beam-up device. And the newest Star Trek spin-off, Deep Space Nine, was launching its own line of toys with series star Avery Brooks on hand. I like participating in myth-making, you see. It's a wonderful thing for succeeding generations. Those ever-popular Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are back, including a troll variation and their own attack vehicle, the Ninja Turtle Grappler. There we go. And remember Rock'em Sock'em robots from the 60s? Now there's Street Fighter II robot kickboxers for the 90s. For little girls, Barbie is celebrating her, ooh, 34th birthday and has a new colorful image. And Baby Yummy munches on real french fries and just like a real baby, drools all over. He unfurls his cape, takes it to the skies of Gotham City. Batman toys are still expected to be big sellers and the Toy Fair featured a lot of items with motion picture tie-ins, including the upcoming Schwarzenegger movie Last Action Hero and the dinosaur thriller Jurassic Park. But if you or your child works up an appetite playing with all these new toys, well, McDonald's has cooked up its own line of fast food McToys. We like to use cereal mixed with peanut butter and Nestle's Quick, which we grind up using this hand crank. A patty's worth of meat drops into the catcher here, and we transfer it to the grill. Caught up with some of the legends, I mean the legends of the comic world this weekend. They were in town to attend a convention sponsored by Parts Unknown, a local comic book store. From their pens come the pictures that have fueled a million imaginations.
These are drawings from the pages of comic book history, the glory days of the old EC, or entertaining comics. For kids of the 40s and 50s used to superheroes, EC represented a change. Their stories were completely different. There were individual stories. There were no main characters. There were just one-shot stories, be, be it horror or science fiction or war. And uh, the kids had never had this kind of a comic book before. Williamson helped bring Secret Agent X-9 to life along with the stories of Flash Gordon, Weird Science, Big Ben Bolt, and Star Wars. Another EC artist, George Evans, says working there was the high point of his career, a career that spans nearly five decades. Evans says before that, comics were just kid stuff. The mental level was for small children. EC took it to the point where they figured their readers had the intelligence to grasp what they were saying. And yeah, while they lasted, that was the fun, fun part of the comic books. A lot of fans are now becoming interested in the work of Dave Stevens, one of the new breed of comic book artists. He turns the female form into poetry and turns back the clock in his series, The Rocketeer. But comics are a sideline for Stevens, who does everything from animation to motion picture work. It's just fun. It's, it's not supposed to be heavy, any kind of heavy writing or anything. It's just uh, light, lightweight stuff that's, that's fun to read so, and fun to do. Stevens is one of few new artists to gain the respect of the old guard. And all that admiration isn't wasted either. He knows as well as anyone that there are quite a few pages of comic book history still to be written. If you have the respect of other artists who you look up to, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's the icing on the cake. That's it. Well, if you wonder just how many people are still into comics, this weekend's convention attracted a thousand people in one day. Admirers with the movie that just opened. But longtime Godzilla fans are also celebrating this weekend in Chicago, the site of this year's first G-Con. This was the scene at last year's G-Con, as about 1,000 devoted American fans paid homage to the legendary lizard in New York City. I'm loving the convention. It's a beautiful thing. Big fan, number one. Four hours of pain here. Number one, Godzilla rules, man. The first film made its American debut back in 1956. Since then, Godzilla has become an enduring icon for several generations of fans, many of whom were there for G-Con 97. When I was young, everything I did had Godzilla in it. Like, if they had to draw Christmas cards in school, I would draw Godzilla on it. The dealer room was jammed with fans willing to drop loads of lizard green loot for prized memorabilia. I'm a huge Godzilla fan. It's like a big collector and a, uh, everything Godzilla. I bought $20,000 or more worth of merchandise. Convention organizer John Roberto. Well, the main point of the convention is to bring fans together who like Japanese science fiction and give them a chance to meet. And, of course, our special guest from Japan, the two men who played Godzilla, which is the main draw for this type of convention. Well, let's have a nice uh, New York welcome to the men who played Godzilla. Jikan's special guests were none other than Haruo Nakajima and Kenpachiro Satsuma the actual guys who slithered into the often cumbersome Godzilla costume. My name is uh, Kenpachiro Satsuma. <laughs> the current Godzilla suit, the one for Godzilla vs. Destroyer, weighed 286 pounds. About five people helped me put on the suit. They are called Godzilla Gakari, the people in charge of Godzilla. Hello? Everybody. Mr. Nakajima is the original man in the Godzilla suit, having played the role in the first 12 films. We had to work hard in each scene. We would read the script and then, along with the director, decide how best to choreograph each scene. We couldn't afford to goof off. Transforming oneself from ordinary human to giant monster is no easy feat. The first thing is how to become Godzilla completely. I convince myself that I'm Godzilla. I'm Godzilla. Then I become Godzilla and get inside the suit. Otherwise, I could not do it. I just tell myself, I'm Godzilla. Then I get inside. This way I can play him quite well. 
The original Godzilla met his maker in the last Japanese film, Godzilla vs. Destroyer. But now that Hollywood has created a new computerized version of the beloved behemoth, a whole new generation is about to become addicted to the lizard. I saw Godzilla 1954, which is actually 56 with Raymond Buck. I've seen that movie about 5,000 times since I was six years old. So it's like, you know, th this has been an influence in my life since I was a child, and I can't shake it. Attention, Star Trek fans. The Creation Star Trek convention beams into Louisville's Executive West Hotel on Sunday, April 18th, with special guest Walter Koenig, the legendary Chekhov, in person. Don't miss the Star Trek dealers, events, contests, auctions, autographs with Chekhov, and inside news on Star Trek The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. Walter Koenig, Chekhov, in person at the Creation Star Trek convention, Sunday, April 18th, at the Executive West Hotel. Tickets at Ticketmaster or at the door. Doors open at 11 a.m. You're watching Sleepcore. Sleep tight. So I had a little uh, gold, old uh, XT, I think, was Steven Tsai, uh, creator of Kimigori Orange College. Yeah. Do you see those? Yeah. Um, how are things going with the storyline? Are more printed out? or? Um, we are on, uh, oh, I'm sort of stuck between us. 24 and 26, writing-wise. Uh, -huh. uh, the Dojinchi is waiting on the artists. That's cool. How's that Sailor, uh, Sailor One doing? Yeah, we have posters here. That's cool. Dojinchi here. And we hit where story is up to 11. That's great. Right? There was this whole big deal about this new big deal. My mother always looks at my mail. I don't filter my parents. Yeah, I think I'm going to ask Barry to see 